All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Whedon. I serve as the Director of Program Planning for Secure World Foundation. Uh, and it's great to see everyone here today for this event. This is our first in-person DC luncheon event uh, of this kind since COVID started. And we're very thankful we were able to pull it together and thank all of you for coming out for it. Over the last few weeks, uh, many of us have been watching the news about the success of Artemis I with its pretty spectacular launch, its journey out around uh, the moon, and successful return yesterday. But at least for us policy nerds in the room, the hardware is only part of what makes the Artemis program interesting. There's also the way that it's likely to shape space law and policy and international cooperation. Roughly two years ago, give or take a couple of months, uh, the Artemis Accords were signed by an initial set of eight countries, which has since grown to 21. They represent an attempt to help shape some of these key areas of space law and policy that impact exploration and human spaceflight. And we felt it was a good time to have an event focused on how the Accords originated, what's going on now, and where they may be going in the future. A reminder that today's event is public and on the record. We are recording it and plan to post it early next week. To kick things off today, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Pam Elroy, Deputy Administrator for NASA, a retired Air Force Colonel, former shuttle commander, who is one of only a few people to have done a backflip in the space shuttle. Pam has also served in key leadership roles at NASA and in industry before now coming back to NASA, served one of its top leadership. Uh, and we're very thankful to have her coming to say a few words about the Artemis program, the Artemis Accords, and where things are going. So Pam, the floor is yours. Uh, she's agreed to take a few questions, so at the end, we'll go ahead and do that, um, and I'll walk through that process. Thank you. Yeah, this always happens to me. <laughs> Uh, I want to start out by thanking the Secure World Foundation and, and Brian, of course, for hosting this event. It's, it, is, uh, it is exciting. Uh, it, it is very exciting for us. And I also feel like it's really important to acknowledge Mike Gold and former administrator Jim Bridenstine, as well as a tremendous group of people uh, inside NASA, but also at the State Department, uh, for what it took to get the Artemis Accords going. I know it was a massive effort, and um, it, it's just transformational. So really appreciate that. So um, starting to feel kind of real, huh? <laughs> now that we have uh, Orion back and we've met our major test objectives, there's uh, more work to be done, obviously. Um, but I think, uh, you know, this is, it's, it feels really critical uh, that we continue this work. It was not ahead of time. It uh, may barely be in time uh, for having started this effort. So I think um, I just have to make a comment about the landing and about the mission. You know, I had an interesting experience as a, a shuttle astronaut building the space station. Every single time we added a new piece to the station, there was suddenly a new view, right? There was a new angle that we were looking at the station, looking at the shuttle. Uh, there were new camera locations and things like that. And it just felt every single time we flew an assembly flight that we had a new view of the station. And it was just kind of exciting. It was like, wow, not only is this thing growing, but it was like we had a new lens to look through. And uh, as uh, Kathy Kerner, the deputy in ESD, said recently, the moon may not have changed a lot in the 50 years since we've been there. We have changed tremendously. And I think there's something amazing about the live from the moon, you know, on the TV, and actually seeing the pictures that we're seeing real time. Um, it, it just changes everything. I mean, yes, we have pictures of the moon. We have pictures of the moon, but there's something very different about it, seeing the spacecraft in it, about seeing the spacecraft in it when you see Earth rise, you know, such a, a famous and transformational moment. So the Artemis Accords, of course, were inspired by the Artemis missions, um, but they involve, obviously, a lot of uh, exploration and science activities, something that's really important to us is uh, a major difference with Artemis. Uh, well, a couple of major differences I think you're aware of. The first one is that science is really front and center. 
and we're working hard to make sure that that's the case. In addition to that, because our intent is to go deeper into the solar system with humans to do science and exploration, we really have to think about infrastructure. Uh, the return on investment uh, for science gets smaller and smaller the shorter duration you stay at your destination. We have to figure out how to have people live and work for long periods of time. It's, if you look at what we did with Space Shuttle and Space Station, it was exactly the same idea. It was We would get so much more science if we could have a permanent human presence. And the same thing is true. It has the added benefit, of course, bringing our commercial partners along with us. So uh, in the context of this, we and the other original signatories of the Artemis Accords came together to think about that next era of space exploration and make sure that it was being implemented in accordance with the fundamental principles of responsible behavior. Um, of course, based on the 1967 Outer Space Treaty and other existing international regimes. I guess for me, something that I say a lot and I say it uh, everywhere is that how we go is as important as what we do because we recognize that we are setting precedents. So the potential to set precedents that set us, send us in a direction that we don't wanna go, uh, it's just, it's too much of a risk. We really, really have to be thinking in very practical matters about what we're doing. We're entering a new frontier. We see that, uh, and commercial is pushing as hard as they can, and they're gonna move really fast. So there is an obligation for us to think this through. We need a roadmap whose principles we can agree on, which facilitates dialogue, flexibility, help us devise solutions when we come across some of those things that we didn't predict. We want as many nations as possible to bring their voice to that discussion. As I have often remarked to my international friends, it does not cost anything to be a leader in space policy. What matters is your experience, your thought process, and a diversity of perspective. The current diversity of the signatories of the Accords gives you a sense uh, of how we are trying to pull that together and how much interest there is uh, across the world. So much has actually happened since the first original eight signatories signed the Artemis Accords in October of 2020. While an additional 13 nations have signed since that time with more to come in the very near future, very near future. We've also begun to think about the important business of how do we implement those key accords principles. We had a lot of very interesting conversations with our international partners uh, to ensure that we would have the flexibility to leave implementation as future activity that we would all work on together, and that was very important. And this is my first opportunity uh, to speak in detail about progress on the Artemis Accords implementation since we held our first face-to-face -face meeting with signatories on the margins of the International Astronautical Congress in Paris last September. It was really important to us uh, that uh, this be a fully inclusive event. It was really important that we were not the chair of, of this event and instead we co-chaired uh, with Brazil and with France, um, and it was held at the heads of agencies level. It was really extraordinary. There was participation of 19 of 21 signatories, and um, I took notes, and of the 19 that were there, 17 spoke and actively contributed to the conversation significantly. So uh, that's amazing. So of course, there's only so much you can get done in 90 minutes, but the energy uh, in the room and in the discussion was palpable. So a couple things I noticed. Um, first, it was really clear that the community of Accord signatories thinks that it's urgent to define how we're gonna explore. And we want to assure that we're gonna do so in a way that's safe, responsible, and equitable. That came up as a repeating theme. Taking into account the views not only of spacefaring nations today, but those who have yet to develop that capability and will want to have that opportunity in the future. So we agreed that discussions on implementing the Accords are incredibly important and they're just beginning and we need to make, make progress. 
Second, there was general consensus on several priorities that we should focus on as a community with two important near-term actions. The first was to discuss how we can deconflict activities on the moon and ensure the safety of humans and spacecraft that will be working in close proximity. And the second was to explore how to identify opportunities for emerging space actors, help them understand what the importance of the Artemis Accords is, and to ensure that the early activities that we do and agreements we make by more established spacefaring nations don't preclude later entrance. So that was a very, very powerful theme uh, that we heard over and over. On a longer term basis, uh, we identified the need to define how best to utilize multilateral in, uh, global fora such as UN Copuis to advance the principles espoused in the Accords, building on the lessons and operational expertise developed by the Accord signatories. And the second thing was to monitor progress within each country, this is important, to develop appropriate domestic regulations and oversight for their respective commercial actors and to synchronize those regimes where possible. So that was a really interesting conversation about what the limits uh, of these types of agreements that we make, recognizing that each nation state has the right to develop its own regulatory regime, but the importance of harmonizing it. So I just wanted to restate it because I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And uh, just some astoundingly uh, articulate uh, other members of the s member states just to, I think some, some of um, the participants didn't fully appreciate the difference and then others are just like really got it, but we all went there together. So to help shed some light, particularly on the importance of the near-term discussions about deconflicting activities, earlier this year I asked our Office of Technology Policy and Strategy to do an internal analysis of upcoming lunar landing and operations activities planned around the world. And the results of this study were released last fall. The report noted that within the next four years, the global community is likely to launch at least 22 lunar surface missions, half of which will occur in the moon's south polar region. So that's a lot. And these are sure to be very complex missions. They may not all stay on the schedule that they're on. Some will have uh, technical challenges. Uh, but each one of them has the potential to introduce unintended interference with other activities, either with each other uh, or those following, including landing zones, surface operations, transit, uh, and RFI interference. So this study really helped illuminate the importance of advancing the Artemis Accords um, and the principle of deconfliction, deconfliction of activities with some considerations of, of the kinds of things that we should be talking about in the concept of a safety zone. So just because I'm technical and I can't stand talking policy this long without squeezing something in, I'm going to do it. So I think one of the things that I found very fascinating technically is uh, the lack of science underpinnings that we have, particularly around plume surface interaction, or PSI, because we have to have an acronym for everything. Uh, I think uh, just we're just beginning to understand how far away particles can actually travel in that light gravity environment, and uh, the question of migration uh, of particles. And so you might think, hey, this is my lander, there's no plants or animals, I've, you know, I'm using, I don't know, some chemical, and uh, then I'm going to hit, and then there's going to be particles that go flying all over the place, and they may stay um, essentially, well, airborne, there's no air, but it would, they'll stay above the surface for periods of time and actually can travel a long way. We don't have the science underpinnings around that. So if we're really going to get serious about uh, hazards and deconfliction, we have got to understand this better. And in fact, I brought this up to uh, at a meeting of our CLIPS providers recently um, to discuss, hey, maybe we should be you know, trying to understand the science about this and collecting data. So there you go, my technical commercial for a moment. As we and our Artemis Accords partners continue this important work of understanding how best to implement the Accords, we'll be looking not just at the ideas, but also at the operational experience 
that key partners such as those joining us today, Kness and JAXA and many others can bring to bear because that operational experience is actually gonna ground us in the technical truth. Because we agree, as, as I mentioned, about how we're going to explore is just as important as what we do, I'm grateful that we've had so much success in extending the principles of the Artemis Accords to so many signatories thus far. And I'm very hopeful that we've started an important dialogue that's sure to impact the work we do for generations to come. I truly believe we are at a pivot point. And as we continue this dialogue, uh, form working groups with the Artemis Accords partners, we welcome input from the broader space community, including how we can bring non-state actors involved in the exploration of the moon. So I spend a lot of time thinking about this with our CLIPS providers, um, commercial and nonprofit entities, by the way, into alignment with the spirit of the Artemis Accords and how we continue to propagate those really important foundational principles. So there's a lot of work we have left to do, but I'm looking forward to making progress in this uh, endeavor because having a sustainable environment for the future is absolutely critical. It will uh, set the path of humanity on one path or another, and if we do it right, we can be very thoughtful about what we're doing. So I welcome your questions. So we do have some time for questions. Um, I actually would like to ask something. Please raise your hand. Uh, when the mic comes to you, please identify who you are, your affiliation, and please frame it in the form of a question. Uh, so, uh, Jeff. Hi, Jeff Faust of Space News. Um, so looking ahead, uh, what's the path forward for getting some output from these working groups, um, mm -hmm. developing documents, uh, and another face-to-face -face meeting? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, I will just tell you, this was another very interesting conversation that we had with the signatories to remind everyone that it's one thing to work with our space agency partners, space agency to space agency. It's really important to understand that the Artemis Accords is a political commitment, which means that we have to engage at a different level. And for us, that means the State Department. So it's, it's really important that we are partnered well with the State Department and work together to set the priorities for this. There's a real appetite for it. Um, I think we've had a lot going on with, <laughs> with Artemis and our partners have, have sensed that too. Uh, but I believe in the new year is, is when we will start to form working groups. And I'll just emphasize again, it's really important. I mean, I know that NASA is gonna wanna be engaged on those working groups. Um, but we will not be chairing all of them. Uh, we need to pick subjects that I think are most meaningful and most exciting. And we've got a few. I, I named a couple, but I think there's a few other options out there. And, and ho hope to make progress next year. Hi, uh, Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Congratulations on a great Artemis one mission that was really exciting to watch and, and to cover, and in typical newspaper reporter fashion, well, you know, what have you done for us uh, lately? I just wonder if you could give us a quick uh, update on Starship. Uh, the administrator was asked about this yesterday and he gave us a little bit, but I just wonder if you can build upon that, any updates in terms of the schedule when you, you know, how things are, are going. Thanks so much. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go out to Boca Chica and spend the day out there a couple weeks ago. Um, and got a, got a pretty good sense of where they're going. They are in a hardware-rich environment, let's put it this way. They are ready to test. Um, they do have some things that they have to finish before they can test, and that's a very important reason, you know, Gwen is really focused uh, on doing that. But it was, it, you know, it was amazing to see their production line. They have a lot of hardware. So I think once they can, can sort some things out, I'll just make another observation, which is, um, and I've I've known this forever since I was at the, you know, well not forever since I was at the FAA, how hard it is to develop a new location to launch rockets from. Safety is everything, and so when there's so much precedent, so much work that's gone in before places like you know the range and all the capabilities. It is, it, it's very challenging to set up a new location. And I think they're just experiencing some of those things. 
but you know, we, um, um, we're, you know, they're ready to go test and I think they, they've got the design ready to go do some serious hardware testing and they're beyond the, we're gonna probably blow up the pad phase, so. Marcia Smith, SpacePolicyOnline.com. Could you talk a bit about what you're doing to get other countries to sign on to the Accords? Is the U.S. proactively going out and talking to countries, especially the ones that are planning to launch to the moon, or are you waiting for countries to come to you? And you talked about the challenge of getting the non-state actors on board, the commercial companies, et cetera. What's going on in that regard? Yeah, great questions, Marcia. Thank you. You know, I think, um, America's leadership is very important. Uh, at the same time, we just need to recognize that this is not about the U.S. telling everybody what to do. That's not what this is about. One of the things that I found really interesting at the uh, Accords signatories uh, discussion was how many people wanted to talk about how to communicate to their regional partners why the Artemis Accords was important. Uh, which is wonderful. And uh, in fact, I, I have to give kudos to Canada. Uh, Lisa Campbell, um, the head of the Canadian Space Agency, she is very, very active. She brings this up in as near as I can tell any international engagement that she has. So we certainly bring it up and we you know, have meetings. Um, we've got like, what, 150 agreements around the world and you know, 67 countries or something along that lines. And, you know, when we have meetings, we certainly raise it as a, hey, are you interested in talking about this? Um, but it's, it's, I think it's more important that it be recognized as a multilateral event. And so it's extremely important that all the signatories feel that it's important to bring people along. As far as the commercial piece, um, we have taken the actions to have some discussions. Uh, we had a Eclipse roundtable that we held uh, recently, and this subject came up of the Artemis Accords, and we had a we had a pretty good dialogue. I think this is something that the there's a couple of things going on, right? One of them is the government has to decide who's got on orbit authority, and <laughs> we've been waiting for that for a while. So. I think we have some uh, some activity in that area. Certainly, Tarak has promised that the Space Council is very interested in this, and I, I only ask him about it about every other week. So how how it's going? Uh, I try not to bug him too much. So um, I think there is a lot of interest and in, in activity around that. That will help. Uh, but just having the dialogue with our providers, um, you know, Clips is just really different than our commercial crew, which was deeply enmeshed because we had a certification process. And so it's, CLIPS is a lot more hands off. Um, so, you know, we have alerted uh, those companies that they need to be thinking about international treaties and obligations and things like that. So, thanks. Uh, hi there, uh, my name's Stacy Moore, and I am a, an official NASA fangirl, so quite um, starstruck to be in the present, uh, presence of an actual astronaut. Um, no so one else here is. <laughs> <laughs> I was so glad to hear you mention responsible behavior, uh, considering the U.S. tradition of uh, protecting natural cherished entities uh, from human alteration and the fact that the moon is considered sacred to many cultures around the world. Um, I was wondering if there are any uh, cultural or environmental advisors being consulted as part of the Artemis project and you know, what measures in general are being taken to make sure that we afford the lunar environment the same protections we give the Grand Canyon, say. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you, I, it's so fascinating. You know, when you start talking about responsible use and protection of the environment, people are like, yeah, but they don't have any air or plants or animals. So how hard can this be? Oh, it, it's, it's hard. Um, I think there's, you know, the aspect of, well, what if there is a Grand Canyon, some of the, mo the most beautiful place on the surface of the moon? Don't we care about protecting that? Yes. But then you add in the, the religious and the cultural significance. It's really, really important. But it's also really important that we don't do this in a way that looks like we're saying, I'm fencing this off, 
because this is where Apollo 11 landed, so it has historical significance and don't get within 100 kilometers of it. You know, we, we need to have kind of a, we need to, to we do need to consult people. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about this. There's such a robust um, heritage of that here on Earth where people think about preservation. And um, so I can just tell you, I think, I think we have to connect with those people. And I'm thinking at the global level, like the UNESCO World Heritage Site kind of level, so that, again, everybody should have the opportunity to bring their lens to bear on what that, that responsible use and that protection needs to be. Um, we should be deciding this as a human race with the best experience that we've got. So uh, that's actually one of the subjects we're thinking about having a working group on, potentially. Um, there are other things that feel kind of more like a crisis, like in the near term, uh, like the harmful interference and the protection you know, of activities that might happen next year, um, but it is on the list. So thank you for bringing it up. Hi, Pam. Chris Kunstadter, XXL Space Insurance. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about um, uh, mission authorization, and I'm wondering if that's a component of the discussions that the parties are having around the Artemis Accords. Is that, um, is that something that you're encouraging other uh, signatories to, to, to work on, and how do you see NASA helping in that process? Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. I, I appreciate that. The, um, I think that the US, as probably most people would agree, have been out ahead, Commercial Space Launch Act, the regulations. Um, we have a lot of maturity in our, relatively speaking, globally, in our commercial space law and our commercial space regulations, which means a lot of people come to the FAA and ask for help and advice when they're standing up their own regimes. Um, it is interesting to me, uh, though, I, I don't think it's actually going to stay that way. It, it's really clear to me that it's not going to stay that way. Um, so what we talked about at the signatories event was harmonization, right? That, that's really important. It, it, you know, we talk about interoperability as it refers to hardware. There's interoperability when it comes to laws and regulations as well. Like how do you not get off in it, and some of this is just like safety based. The hardware stuff is really a no brainer. Hey, if you know, if you can't access somebody else's airlock to save somebody, right, that doesn't make any sense, that kind of stuff. But I think um, this regulatory, if we're not careful, we're gonna end up in a, in a place where we may be uh, something that you do see here, even in the United States, which is people trying to regulate each other out of business. Right, they're trying to get preferential treatment uh, for their business model that then disadvantages other businesses. So that's why we use the word harmonization because I think it's important to recognize that's that that we don't want that kind of behavior, but we also need to allow each country their autonomy. It's a tough problem. One more. All right, oh. nobody can follow Chris. Please join me in thank you. Thanks. We're now going to turn to our second speaker, uh, Mr. Sean Fuller, uh, who serves as the Gateway International Partner Manager for NASA. Uh, in that role, he's been responsible for the technical and programmatic integration of NASA's Gateway International Partners. Sean has had a long career at NASA working in human spaceflight, including establishing operational interfaces with international partners. And uh, we've asked him here today to talk a little bit how the Gateway interacts with both the Artemis program and the Accord. So, Sean, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Brian, and, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's my pleasure to come here today and talk to you, and certainly on the heels of a wonderfully successful Artemis One mission, and, and just hats off to the teams 
uh, here in the U.S. and really around the world that made that happen. It's great to see that first step. We've got a lot more following on after that, and the ball is certainly rolling. As I say, the train has left the station. It's a great place to be in and looking ahead to the future and have the pleasure today to talk to you about some of that and how we're taking the Artemis Accords uh, that we've been uh, built on and standing really on the shoulders of the giants that, that helped make that happen. As Pam pointed out, uh, some of those key folks and enabled us in the gateway world and our agreements to actually put that into action and be moving ahead, starting with the hardware, to make this a reality. So we're celebrating right two years and a couple months worth of uh, Artemis Accords, uh, signing that with the first eight and enrolling. And very shortly after that, on the heels of that, uh, two years ago this month, uh, we signed our final uh, agreements for the inter initial international partnership of Gateway factoring in those Artemis Accords. And just a, a hats off to some of the folks here in the room that made that happen. Uh, Mike, when he wore a, a little different lapel pin there, I think Karen uh, as well, and Chris and Gabriel, and I see some of our international partner colleagues as well. Uh, we'll hear uh, a little later from Asami and Sylvie uh, also that helped us all as a partnership come together in developing these agreements for Gateway with the vision of the future, not only lunar exploration, but looking beyond, as we like to say, moon to Mars, and stepping from uh, our, our capabilities at the moon and building it out and onto Mars. And so as part of those agreements of Gateway that have established that partnership, we included many of those elements and the principles of the Artemis Accords that are now in our fabric and what we're doing, what I do on a daily basis uh, with the teams around the world, in developing Gateway, you know, starting with uh, certainly the peaceful purposes for it. We're taking that uh, experience we have, a lot of wonderful experience with many of our partners on ISS, expanding that onto Gateway, doing that for all of humanity. It, it, it's opening up new opportunities for many of us uh, to see that, that opportunity in cislunar space and use it as a launching pad uh, off to the future as well. Uh, along with that, we talk, uh, Pam talked a little bit about interoperability standards. We actually started those about four or five years ago and have developed interoperability standards. We have nine different standards uh, that we adhere to in the Gateway program, but then throughout Artemis that define that interoperation at the interface level. Uh, requirements that we flow down into Gateway as we develop the modules as well but define that and also enable us, one of the other very important aspects of the Artemis Accords, of emergency uh, crew rescue capabilities. When you define those interfaces now and other vehicles are developed with that in mind, you have that interoperability there. So from a gateway standpoint, you know, we, we learned a lot, and, and I always like to draw corollaries to ISS. You know, When we first launched ISS, uh, I don't think any of us would have predicted what it looks like today and the opportunities it's had and new partnerships there and new opportunities, commercial uh, and international partners. But doing that and doing that by standards uh, now and, and utilizing that as part of the Artemis Accords as other nations are developing capabilities with that interoperability there, it can certainly play in and factor in to things like Gateway and the other elements uh, of Artemis as well. Uh, as we look at it, one of the key aspects, of course, as well is utilization. Uh, we're gonna have Gateway as a platform that, that enables that sustainable crude exploration to the lunar surface and on the Mars in the future as well. But we're also being, gonna be doing a lot of utilization all the time there. And as Pam talked about it, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us. We're actually gonna start on Gateway with that utilization at the first element launch. We have uh, utilization experiments from NASA, from our European colleagues, from our Japanese colleagues, looking at radiation environments, uh, internal and external uh, on Gateway. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, a dust sensor uh, from our, our Japan colleagues. Pam talked about the dust on a surface. Well, you kind of look at what are you transporting up as well? What is that doing to, uh, to outside of your vehicle, to mechanisms and interfaces? And so that's one of our early utilization uh, experiments, but that's not just for us and just for that partnership. Adhering to those Artemis Accord uh, principles and standards, that data is gonna be open and available. And so one of our guiding principles and agreements within the partnership of, uh, of Gateway for utilization is we will have that data and have it available within six months out to the public once we uh, uh, wrap that data together. Now, I will tell you there's a little caveat on that because when you talk about human research, a lot of times that gets into personally identifiable. Uh, we'll certainly be doing human research uh, on Gateway but that data will take a little bit longer uh, for the, the bit that can be identified to particular crew members, 
but eventually that will get in the realm as well of publicly available research data really that, that benefits all of us. And so we take all those, those uh, key principles uh, from the Artemis Accords, we build them into our gateway agreements uh, that we have now that's resulting in the work and the hardware uh, that's being produced. And so as a, as a program guy, I love coming up here and talking about the agreements, but I'd feel remiss if I didn't give you a little peek into the hardware that's being built and, and going to be flying in space as well. Uh, so we have uh, uh, across NASA, uh, the first couple of elements, the power and propulsion element, that's being uh, built in California as we speak by Maxar, uh, built off their 1300 bus. And so we have a central cylinder, that's kind of the, the, the central section of it. That's been manufactured, starting to do the, the additional components out of it, uh, doing some testing for the early, uh, or for the thrusters, both the six kilowatt and 12 kilowatt, very large electric propulsion thrusters, all that's progressing. Uh, the second half of the first element uh, of gateways called the uh, uh, HALO, Habitation Logistics Outpost, we're just finishing uh, the manufacturing that primary structure in Italy uh, for Northrop Grumman. And it'll be sent to the US here, uh, later part, uh, middle part of next year in a few months to continue that outfitting. And also, as we add into it, like I said, this is part of a partnership. That first launch is made possible by several key elements, uh, power systems, battery systems for our Japan colleagues, a lunar communication systems uh, from ESA that will communicate between the surface up through Gateway and back down to the Earth. Again, using those interoperability standards, which means it enables others in, in that vicinity uh, for that communication system. So it makes it an, a very open uh, architecture and possibilities uh, out there. And then of course our, our colleagues in Canada with the robotic interfaces that enables that early science. And so around the partnership, we have hardware uh, that's being built and manufactured and moving ahead to that first launch. Uh, looking forward to, to seeing that, uh, the launch, and will take us uh, about a year to spiral out into uh, our NRHO orbit uh, which is a new unique orbit, and again, I, I can relay that back to the Artemis Accords and some of the principles in there. You know, uh, it's a nice pristine orbit now. There, there's one thing in NRHO orbit, Capstone uh, was a, a CubeSat that launched a while ago and entered orbit about a month ago. Helps us kind of understand it. So it's a, I kind of think of it like the, the luster of new snow. Uh, we don't get that in Houston, but you see that here in, in Washington. Before anybody steps on it, it's nice and clean. Uh, that's kind of what that orbit is. It's nice and clean. It's got one uh, object in it. And we've learned a lot from uh, low Earth orbit. When we first started flying ISS and, and back in my career, we, we rarely had to worry about a debris avoidance maneuver or, or something entering the orbit that we had to watch out for. Now it's nearly a weekly occurrence. And so part of our principles that we carry forward, again, branching out of Artemis Accords and, and, and looking into our agreements, and how do we produce and, and operate gateway is minimizing and, and eliminating really that orbital debris. And so one of the things that we have, of course, a, a spacecraft, you need a logistics vehicle to help support that, to bring the supplies for the crew, both operating at gateway and then down to the lunar surface. And so baked into that is that operations philosophy and agreements on how we bring it up, we contain all of our trash within the vehicle don't let anything uh, escape externally or internally, uh, and then send the vehicle off into a safe, disposable, heliocentric orbit that stays away from us, doesn't pollute the cislunar environment. And so again, taking those, adhering to those principles of the Artemis Accords and, and making that possible uh, in the fabric of what we do. And so with that, we're also uh, uh, certainly uh, many other elements uh, across Gateway, our European colleagues and Japanese colleagues with the uh, I have module uh, that just started its welding uh, in Italy as well, uh, followed on by a refueling module uh, from our European colleagues. It's uh, in its uh, design phases along with uh, Canada Arm 3. And so really the, the, all the elements, uh, I would tell you, those first elements of gateway uh, on contract, hardware being built. But then I look to the future and I, I really think this is one of the beauties of the Artemis Accords is if I look at gateway, that's not a complete gateway. We also need a crew and science airlock for it. We see spacewalks that happen on ISS uh, frequently, uh, the robotic arm that takes uh, science inside and outside. You don't need the crew time to do that. So I talked a bit about Gateway and its crew there uh, 30 to 60 days a year, but all those times outside of it, and, and so an airlock. And so that's one of the components. It's a hardware component of Gateway, but it's an opportunity in the future uh, for a new uh, NASA partner to come along and join as a participant with our partners on Gateway. And so the Artemis Accords kind of lays that out. It sets a foundation 
uh, for the nations that have signed on to it that, that look at that. We have a common understanding and a basis for that and really provides an opportunity for such a new partner uh, to join. I, I'm, I'm happy to say that, that we're certainly in very active negotiations there uh, and, and hopefully in a handful of months we'll hear about a, a new NASA partner uh, from the Artemis Accords that are joining us and uh, joining Gateway, joining uh, with our other partners as a participant and helping make a Gateway happen and really set that up for the future. And so with that partnership, building off the Artemis Accords, you know, we're gonna have Gateway as at that location, not only for the crews that come in and go down to the surface, an open architecture, interoperability standards, it allows it to grow from there, uh, both for Cislunar, but then we also have that eye ahead to the future as a stepping stone building off of that to go to Mars as well. And so with that, and you know, with the Artemis Accords, uh, we kind of build that together. And like at NASA, we talk about Artemis, we like to say we go together. And so we take that, we take that vision, we, we build it together on, on Gateway, and we go together, Gateway and a surface, and then beyond out to Mars as well. So again, just a wrap up, uh, really happy to be here to see what's happening uh, within Gateway, the implementation of the uh, Artemis Accords, and it's, it's helping make the future happen. Looking forward to the day that we see the great images from Orion that's gone, uh, taught, brought crew, crew going down to the surface and looking back on, on our Earth and giving that, us that perspective. Nothing like getting humanized there. So, thank you. I owe Pam, you gave them all to her. <laughs> All right, if I can invite the panel to come up and join me for the next part of this. Okay, moving on to part three. Uh, in this discussion, we hope to pick up on some of the themes that both Pam and Sean brought up in their opening remarks, uh, and also dig in a little more detail on some of the, the history and some of the what's going on currently, and, and hopefully some of the plans for the future. Um, and I'm very thankful today to have be joined by some of the people who are actually making this work. Uh, and who actually helped build the Accords, who are doing active negotiations, uh, and who are involved in some of these activities. Uh, so going from my right down to the table, we have Mike Gold, who currently serves as Chief Growth Officer at Redwire, where he leads their business development marketing. Uh, but for this conversation, as was mentioned, what's really important is his prior posting at NASA, which was the triple threat, uh, Associate Administrator for Space Policy and Partnerships, Acting Associate Administrator, Office of International Interagency Relationships, and Senior Advisor, the Administrator for International Legal Affairs. Did I miss anything? No, you need a bigger card. <laughs> Nothing's yes. like about Redwire. I have a short title now. Yeah, um, and, and in that, and in those roles, he played a, a founding role in the creation of the courts. We'll get to in a minute here. Um, sitting next to him is Christina Leszczak, a Foreign Service Officer with the Office of Space Affairs, the Department of State. Uh, and she's stepping in this morning uh, for Valda, who unfortunately was able to make it. Uh, so we're very thankful to Christina for doing so at very short notice. Um, in her role, she works on international, she has background in international public policy, real estate, and startup experience. In her role, the State Department, she works as a foreign service officer, area management officer, and a financial economist. Uh, and she currently heads up public outreach on the Artemis Accords within the State Department's Office of Outer Space Affairs. So next to her, we have Dr. Masami Onoda, director of the JAXA Washington DC office, representing the Japanese Space Agency in the Americas. Uh, Masami has extensive experience in international affairs across a wide range of space activities, including remote sensing and space applications. Uh, and finally on the end, we have Nicolas Maubert, representative of, of CNES, the French Space Agency, and space counselor to the French Embassy in the United States. He too has a wide range of experience across multiple space sectors, including the European Spaceport in French Guiana and the Galileo program. So Mark, Mike, I'll start with you. Um, 
Can you recap for us what the original intent was with the Artemis Accords, uh, and what did you hope to achieve at the time? What kind of goal were you talking about? This. This is what I hope to achieve. This moment. A successful launch of Artemis One. There's beautiful pictures from Orion. Thank you, Redwire. There were cameras there. But this moment, I, I could not have asked for anything more of the success of the program and the success of the Accords, which was actually the purpose of what we wanted to accomplish. That, you've heard me say before, the challenge with beyond LEO human spaceflight at NASA was that failure wasn't just an option, it was a certainty. NASA has failed to implement a beyond LEO human spaceflight program since Apollo. Every time there was a partisan shift in administration, different plan, it failed. And with Artemis, we really had one last shot. And I feared that without Artemis, America would never lead a global beyond LEO human spaceflight coalition again. Yet here we are, now going from one partisan administration to another successfully and sustainably, and boy, did it take a village. And Pam was very kind in thanking me, but uh, then at Department of State, Gabriel Swinney, uh, I think it was the first person I called about the Accords, you know, I was going into NASA, fellow Star Trek fan, of course, Artemis Accords, you know, I'll leave you reporters to figure out the Star Trek context. Uh, fellow Red Sox fan, Jonathan Margolis over at Department of State. And before we could unite the world, we needed to unite with state. And that partnership between NASA and Department of State was absolutely vital to the success of the Accords and getting through the C-175 process, which is the scariest terms I've ever heard. But, you know, Karen Feldstein, the whole IR team, Neil, I see in the audience, he was the original note taker uh, with the Accords. Sean, you know, we kind of got there and, well, we got some stories with Gateway, was with Sean, and then the international partners, Masami and Nicholas, and Nicholas in particular with Gateway. I, I mean... It took all of us, even you in the media, you know, everyone helped to accomplish what I think is an incredible uh, and lofty goal. So the sustainability was the first part, that we knew to get Artemis to another administration. And Jim you know, was saying he needed two things, bipartisanship, which Jim was definitely up for, and, and he spent more time talking to Democrats than Republicans. He did an amazing job bringing this country together. And Jim was the only person who had Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence on the same page. He should get a Nobel Peace Prize for that. Uh, and then we knew that international was a vital aspect to the continuity and sustainability of Artemis. That if you look at the International Space Station in stark contrast to our Beyond LEO human spaceflight programs, the ISS had become the crown jewel and the foundation of human spaceflight. Why had it lasted so long versus Beyond LEO? International. It was the international aspect. So we knew that we needed the Accords to do that. And then next, diversity. You know, we talk about diversity as a moral thing, and it certainly is morally correct, but if you want to solve a problem, a more diverse group is going to be better than a homogenous one. And bringing the world together, so many different cultures, so many different ideas to tackle a problem, you will ultimately be more successful. So there are substantive mission-oriented reasons to have this global coalition for the diversity of thought and capability and funding uh, that it's able to bring. So that was incredibly important to us. And then finally, the norms of behavior that, as Pam says, and you know, don't forget that when Pam was Deputy Associate Administrator of the FAAST, she founded DARPA Confers as well. So she's no newbie when it comes to policy. And the fact that we had this opportunity, we're going back to the moon, was so popular in the international community to then transition that enthusiasm to create norms of behavior transparency, interoperability, avoiding harmful interference. So much of what we've talked about today, it was just an inflection point that we had to take advantage of to build a better future and one that we could be proud of. And you know, I'll just close by saying that the journey of Artemis is to the moon and Mars, but the destination of the Accords is peace and prosperity. Almost spoken like a diplomat. Good job, Mike. Wow. <laughs> um, so picking up from that, um, Christina, as we mentioned earlier, there was the original group of eight, and there's been 13 more that have come on board, and there's more discussions that are going on. So can you talk from the State Department's perspective, what has that process been of 
expanding the accords, of socializing, of doing the kind of public engagement uh, that, that Pam talked about earlier. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you to the Secure World Foundation. Um, I am here representing the Office of Space Affairs for my office director, Valda Vickmanis Keller, who unfortunately could not attend today. Um, so when we think about international engagement and international cooperation, um, like the NASA Deputy Administrator mentioned, we don't do it alone. And um, I work as my office's lead for the Artemis Accords, and together with NASA's Office of International Relations and, inter sorry, of NASA's Office of International and Interagency Relations, I always get that acronym wrong, um, we co-lead on the Artemis Accords for the U.S. government. And so we engage prospective signatories and we engage on Artemis Accords activities. But to better answer your question regarding the role of the State Department and specifically the process, the process in many ways is classic diplomacy. So that means communication with governments. It means fostering peaceful cooperation between state actors. And this, for our office, extends to the civil space domain. And while we're not technical experts, we work heavily with NASA hand in hand to speak about the Artemis Accords with our US embassies overseas, as well as with our foreign counterparts, which include space agencies, as well as foreign missions. And much of this work has involved organized briefings to explain what the Artemis Accords are and what they're not. And we emphasize in our briefings that they are a whole of government process. So as the NASA Deputy Administrator mentioned, the Artemis Accords are a high-level political commitment. So what that means is that they are not a bilateral agreement with the United States, they're not a binding treaty, there's no exchange of funds, and we find that having representatives from the government as well as space agencies incredibly important in when we discuss what it means to sign the Artemis Accords. Um, and another thing that we emphasize is that the United States is not the gatekeeper of the Artemis Accords. So the Artemis Accords belong to all signatories. Um, we have Japan, we have France here today, and that is a really important message that we want to relay to prospective signatories. We also continue to encourage all responsible spacefaring nations to sign the Artemis Accords, and we also encourage countries that are just developing their space sector to also consider signing the Artemis Accords. We stress that interested countries do not need to come to the table with existing space capabilities or even near-term plans to contribute to Artemis. We find this opens the conversation up to a much more diverse group. And we're proud of the 21 signatories that have signed the Artemis Accords and we look forward to more joining uh, very soon. So the State Department and our role, we also play a critical role in international forums such as the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, so COPUS, including um, what we did was in December 2020, we submitted the text of the Artemis Accords to COPUS uh, or to the UN for official distribution to all UN member states. And this was important as one of the principles of the Artemis Accords stresses transparency. And so we wanted to be transparent and allow for conversations and discussions to take place in international settings such as COPUS. And I'll just end here. Um, I want to stress that COPUS remains the preeminent UN forum for state discussions on issues related to international space cooperation. And our work with Artemis Accord signatories is not intended to bypass COPUS, but instead is meant to contribute to the work of COPUS. Thank you. Thank you, and I think we'll pick up on a couple of those things uh, later on. Um, Masami, I'll turn to you, and as we talked about, Japan was one of the original signatories of the Accord, Accords, and from the JAXA perspective, what did your agency find important about them? What was JAXA's motivation in supporting the, the Japanese government uh, to participate in the Accords? So thanks, Brian, for having us here um, with all the colleagues. Um, it's such a nice time also to celebrate and come together. Um, as I look back, when we signed this, it was 2020. 
October, um, and um, it was in the midst of COVID, right? And I was, I was um, most of the negotiations um, back in Japan, actually. Mike would call me at my apartment in Japan, and we would talk, like, just like we are here. Um, and we got so much done um, through that period. It was also not just COVID, but it was um, a time uh, that we were going into, well, you were going into transition, um, <laughs> a transition, uh, the one of the most, I would say, dynamic ones uh, that I know of. <laughs> um, and uh, I uh, thought those two things really were important in what we did, uh, because we, we really nailed what we were supposed to do together as an international community. Um, and I think all the international partners shared that sense that we have to go through this, get this done, get this Artemis program going. Um, so that was a very broad motivation. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I'm uh, well. Uh, we work here. Uh, JAXA well has its own palace in Pennsylvania on Pennsylvania, but also we work very close to the embassy. I have uh, Koji-san and Narita-san from the uh, Japan embassy here. Uh, Tani-san, my colleague, is here too, um, and uh, I'm just here as the most talkative woman um, from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, um, really, uh, we worked in tandem with the government. Uh, the signatory was the government, our ministers. Um, but JAXA, as JAXA, we found the Artemis Accords uh, very important, of course, to push forward our uh, space programs, to have an environment where uh, it will be uh, more, uh, of course, sustainable, safe, uh, responsible, um, also predictable, uh, stable, um, for us to carry out our space programs. Um, uh, in, in other words, uh, to, that will facilitate our space programs and uh, the Accords would um, uh, promote um, such uh, building such an environment uh, on the moon and beyond, um, and that was that was what we thought the Artemis Accords could achieve, um, and uh, our contribution to Gateway, as Sean uh, kindly pointed out, um, uh, that we we have. Um, initial components on uh, HALO. We have uh, cooperation with ESA um, on IHAB. And uh, of course, we will go on to uh, the moon surface with uh, uh, Pinpoint Landing SLIM, the Lunar Polar Exploration um, mission uh, with ESRO. Uh, Cornell is not here today, maybe. Oh, yes, he is. So with uh, the Indian Space Agency. Um, and uh, MMX, of course, uh, so many partners, um, uh, and also with a pressurized rover at the end of the 2020s, um, HTV-X um, and X Gateway G uh, that we hope to uh, bring uh, our, our transportation capabilities uh, for lunar activities as well. So all of these uh, we want to uh, uh, carry out in the um, uh, in, in the sustainable, safe manner and responsible manner um, as, as much as we can. So we uh, are very much looking forward to this uh, international collaboration. Great, thank you. And, and Nicholas, turn to you. France is one of the countries that has been part of the, the, the second bigger group of countries that have joined since the, the initial group. So actually the same question. Um, what did Knesset and, and, and France in general find important about the Accords? What was the motivation to participate? Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. So yes, you pointed out we, we took our time in France to really figure out the interest in signing. And uh, as Mike uh, was saying, uh, first challenge was to work between NASA and the US. I had to convince four different ministers working with space in France, who are Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Research Innovation, of Economy, and of Defense. So all of four ministers uh, were working in the assessing effectively the Artemis Accord. And in fact, uh, we, we had to answer several questions. First, effectively, to confirm that the momentum in exploration was a reality. You know, it was in the middle of a change of the administration. I think for the first time, you know, you mentioned the uh, exploration program hardly survived. You know, shift in the administration usually, and, but now 
we confirmed after the, the election, the chair administration, that it was the case. Um, also, we had to assess the uh, political impact uh, uh, and scope of the accord. Uh, many, you know, France, uh, we already advocate of multilateralism, and uh, initially there was this uh, fear or criticism about, you know, called Artemis Accord, uh, dealing with a principle to deal with uh, activities in outer space in general. So we had to figure out that it was not against or uh, interfering with the multilateral uh, forum, and you clarify that uh, this is not the case. The nature as well of the accord, uh, especially we, it, we took time to figure out it was not legally binding for us. It was important to, to stress that uh, our commitment to the, to the accords doesn't prevent us to still partner with other uh, partners that are not signatories of the accord. And finally, also the content, and perhaps we can discuss this uh, a bit uh, in detail further, you know, to assess the compliance with the Outer Space Treaty when we talk about safety zones, about uh, in-situ resource utilization. So there are things to, that we are analyzing uh, carefully. So, but uh, we joined finally, uh, and uh, after many uh, discussion and fruitful meetings, and uh, for many reasons, but perhaps two of them. First, because effectively there is a huge momentum in exploration, and we want to be part of it, of course. Uh, you know, France uh, has always been on the forefront of, uh, of space and exploration, and uh, especially this year, so there is a huge momentum, you know, in, a, in our French-US cooperation, but also with international partners. We had incredible years. We set up a, a space comprehensive dialogue in Paris in November. We had the state visit of President Macron two weeks ago with a dedicated space sequence focusing on uh, climate change, but also uh, exploration. So we, we think that uh, this Artemis Accord presents huge opportunities not only for technical and scientific uh, programs, but also, you know, from a diplomatic point of view, programmatics, uh, for, for industries, uh, for, uh, for, um, for technologies as well. And, um, and in fact, we are, we are already part of uh, the Artemis program, mainly through ESA. And uh, so we had a ministerial conference uh, a few weeks ago confirming effectively the, the involvement of the European Space Agency in exploration. So France, with our contribution to ESA, is a prime uh, um, prime uh, of uh, the Esprit module, so the, the service module of, um, of uh, the gateway. Uh, we contribute also to the European service module, of course, uh, but also on a bilateral basis. So this year we have signed two agreements. Uh, Lucy and uh, Farsight CX mixed suits, which are scientific instruments on board CLIPS missions that will be launched in 2025, you know, scientific missions uh, uh, prior to the uh, human exploration. So, but we want to, to expand our bilateral cooperations and uh, we found opportunities. There is a huge momentum in France as well with industries. So not only space industries, but uh, uh, industries that are not uh, used to, to, to space uh, business, but uh, with um, the moon, uh, for instance, with the moon uh, surface architecture. So we need plenty of different uh, techno technological building blocks, uh, habitats, uh, medical centers for mobility, telecom. And uh, we have plenty of factors who are willing to, to, to be part of the game. I think the Artemis Accord are really is, uh, uh, a key for that. But on top of that, the second uh, uh, reason why we have joined mainly is effectively that we believe that we need a, a regulatory framework for human exploration. And uh, we always said in the beginning that for us, Artemis Accord are, are only a first step towards you know, multilateral uh, agreements uh, to be uh, agreed um, at the UN COPROS level, for instance. And it is perfectly said in the, in the Artemis Accord, so there are references to the COPROS, you mentioned it, Kay, as well. Uh, it is really said that uh, the signatory will use their experience to contribute to multilateral efforts. So we will see the Artemis Accord as a, yeah, a, a, a case study to, to, to build experience and to help uh, discussion at, uh, at copious level. And the uh, final word is effectively what we aim in France. We, we, we say that our objective is effectively to define a regulatory framework, whatever the form is, at, on the international scene uh, to be able to frame the, the uh, human exploration activities. And just to emphasize that, that that point that they've all made and Pam met, this is our, you know, I think a lot of people when the accords were announced were sort of wondering why it's taking from a public perspective so long for other countries to join and, and why there hasn't been a huge rush. Part of it is just the interagency coordination, the intergovernmental coordination uh, that, that, that Nicholas talked about, that Masami's talked about, that Mike talked about just in the U.S. Uh, that's a real thing in a lot of countries, especially countries for which maybe space exploration is a new thing. And so I, I you know, those have been, that have seen that happen, uh, we're not really that surprised, but it's been good to see this sort of continuous 
uh, accretion of countries. And I mentioned we're, we're expecting a couple more here very soon. Um, Mike, you've now moved from NASA to the commercial side. So how does that change your perspective on the Accords? And, and we came, mentioned a little bit earlier in, in Pam's talk about the question of the mission authorization. Um, but I think originally you, you mentioned that the Accords were not designed to apply directly to industry or commercial activities. But I wonder if you can unpack that a little bit. Uh, first of all, I'm glad no one's come up to me and say, well, why didn't it take longer to get more people into the Accords? Uh, this was warp speed for something of this level. And, and again, I have to thank you know Masami and, and Nicholas. The role that you all played and that the attaches here in the DC embassies played was critical. It would not have happened without both of you. I also am convinced- It was Japanese a pleasure to work days and nights with you. <laughs> And he is not kidding. That is literally uh, true. And, and we had some long talks on Gateway, as Sean knows. Uh, I'm convinced the Japanese speak much better English than we do. I wish we could have uh, our friends in Japan review everything. And you know, as Nicholas had described, to get France and the other nations on board, it really does require it. There's death taxes in C-175. Everyone's got one, right? So it's uh, amazing. When it came to yesterday, you know, this was Super Space Sunday. It wasn't just Artemis that landed. It was uh, our friends at iSpace, and congratulations. I think we got Marshall in the room there uh, on the terrific launch. Uh, and to our friends in Japan, of course. And, you know, that was one of the wonderful things about the Accords, is seeing Accords family of nations, countries, I won't say without the U.S., U.S. participated, but working together. So United Arab Emirates and the Rashid Rover uh, going up you know, with Japan. It was just wonderful to see and is an example of the private sector aspect of the Accords and this larger picture because it wasn't just the government Artemis program that had a great day on Sunday. It was that lunar rover and also uh, the first purchase of lunar resources from NASA that was happening. So uh, a lot going on on Sunday. And from the private sector perspective, what we really wanted from the Accords, and I'll say from government as well, is to prevent conflict. Prevent conflict before it happens. Because conflict is bad for business, at least for our business and exploration. And that's why the purpose of the Accords was peace and so much conflict here on Earth is caused by misperceptions, miscommunications, which is why transparency is the spine that runs throughout the Accords. And now we need to find ways to implement it. And you know, Kay noted relative to the role of COPUS, again, the Accords were meant to implement these international treaties that were developed by COPUS because you can't just take the Outer Space Treaty, and as many talented attorneys as we have at NASA, to hand it over to them and say, do this. That there needed to be a degree of fidelity below that in terms of how implementation would be done with the Artemis program. And here in the private sector, uh, again, we've got ISRU activities that we're talking about uh, at Redwire, building the uh, arrays for uh, the power and propulsion element will be the largest solar arrays, I believe, ever deployed by humanity. We need to be operating in a zone where we know there won't be conflict and what the rules are. So issues like safety zones, uh, avoidance of debris mitigation, the fact that we can least extract and utilize resources, these are all vital things for us in the private sector to be able to understand. Additionally, the private sector brings sustainability. That you might not know who's going to be president for 10 years from now, but you can pretty much guess what the private sector companies are at least going to want and what the leadership's going to be. So integrating the private sector helps with that sustainable activities, but now that I'm sitting where I'm sitting, uh, I do have to eat some of my own dog food a, a little bit, and that I always said, We've had the private sector grow and play this amazing role now in space exploration, launching not just cargo, but astronauts, and now actually building a LEO platform themselves, contributing to the gateway. But what we haven't seen enough of is the private sector also engaging at the international and policy level. Because you can't have these discussions without the private sector in the room and have it be effective. The challenge that we have with the international structure is that it was built for governments. And now you've got the private sector playing these important roles. So we need to find new ways through NGOs and 
uh, commercial iterations of the accords, but we have to have the private sector at the table. And for example, I'm headed to Europe this evening to go participate in COSPAR, which is extremely important for the private sector to be there to have those conversations. And that's why I'm going to fall asleep and be tired. But we need the private sector to step up. And I appreciate what the government has been doing to engage this Department of State. And while I love Valda, it is great to have Kay here because she was a part of the Artemis Accords. And it's very uh, important for all of that. So uh, I think sitting where I am, you know, I'm committing to taking the time to go to Coast Bar. And I appreciate that, you know, SpaceX, Blue Origin, several other companies are creating positions for people to work on a full-time basis on these sort of international policy issues. And that's what we need to be successful because the answer is not government or commercial sector. It's always both. So following up with that, I was wondering, Masami or Nicholas, are similar discussions happening in Japan and France with regard to the commercial sector, the private sector? Are you talking about how to incorporate them as well? So I'll go first. Uh, yeah, um, of course. Uh, and like iSpace is a spectacular example this time. Uh, it just happened yesterday morning, very early morning. Um, uh, they launched um, from Cape Canaveral. Um, I wish I was there too. I couldn't this time. But uh, I, I followed on YouTube, which is a fantastic thing we can do now. Um, and uh, they uh, also um, happened to talk with a private um, uh, media um, a person uh, who is investing in, I believe, uh, in, in iSpace also. Um, so they, they did a spectacular job on, on uh, YouTube to um, report on this. Um, and I'd never seen such a long and comprehensive report done by a private media uh, company in Japan. Um, and I wish that will happen much more in the future. So um, the, the um, what I'm trying to say is uh, this is, uh, um, the, the private sector joining is, is really crucial for, for people's understanding on what's going on, what we want to do, uh, not to mention the real um, contribution to the space program itself um, and the technology and the industry contributions. Um, so we are very much working, for, uh, working with um, the private sector as well and to try to establish rules uh, that will promote um, the activities of the private sector. We work heavily with the uh, ministries, particularly the um, cabinet office, the Ministry of um, Economy, Trade and Industry, um, those partners to work to establish uh, um, uh, a, a set of rules that would uh, enable uh, the commercial companies to uh, feel more comfortable working in the space uh, community, so in the space uh, field. So um, that's what we're doing. We have a whole department in Japan also working on this. Yeah, and in France, so we follow effectively this huge evolution of the space ecosystem. You know, you know, we're not anymore a, a bunch of few agencies uh, working together, so there is a full ecosystem. In France, uh, we have one space startup creating every week now. Uh, like three years ago, it was one every six months, so we have to tackle with that. And I can tell you, in, in CNES, uh, we went through a deep reorganization. We have a new directorate, uh, director of strategy, with a, a director, directorate dedicated to, to support the space ecosystem, so the private ecosystem. And uh, also two years ago, so the, the Ministry of Research and Innovation had the mandate for space, and uh, it has been handed over to, to the Ministry of Economy and Industry, so it means something. And uh, effectively, so we are working closely with, uh, with the, the private sector. Um, France, uh, we, we are in charge, of, we, are, we have implemented the Space Operation Act since 2008, so it's really a law dealing with the space activity, whether it's for launchers or for orbital systems. And we are currently, so CNES is a technical authority for updating this law to be endorsed by the government. And we are currently uh, going on uh, an update of this law, uh, mainly to implement the long-term sustainability guidelines agreed in, in 2019 at corporate level, um, also at European level, you know we have the uh, EU SST, so it's a consortium dedicated to, to deal with STM, space traffic management, and uh, we, we want to build up uh, commercial capabilities for for space situational awareness and space traffic management. So, yes, uh, the, the private sector is deeply involved in, in space, and so yeah, so we have to deal with that. So it's more for effectively lower orbit sustainability for exploration. We start the process, so we don't uh, deal about regulation yet uh, at national level about that, but uh, the Artemis Accord is a, a good forum for that. So uh, I'm going to open up to the audience for questions here in, in a minute, uh, so please start thinking of those. 
Uh, but one one last one um, for the whole panel. But I think I'll start with uh, with, with Kay. Um, what impact do you think the accords have had on these discussions on norms of behavior, the future rules and governance that we've been talking about here, and has been talked about more broadly multiple years? Um, do you think they've moved things ahead? Are there particular areas where that is where that is happening uh, that you can sort of talk about as sort of we, we've made progress on these different topics? Thank you for that question. And before I begin, I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> All right. Love to yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that assessing the impact of the Artemis Accords on civil space exploration will take time. Um, and Artemis missions, or the Artemis program, inspired the Artemis Accords, and they're just beginning. But I think a really key part is the communication, which is what you alluded to um, in your first response, and that these types of conversations about what are we doing to work and live together in outer space in a safe and sustainable manner are incredibly important. Um, and I, as the NASA Deputy Administrator um, also mentioned, we, in our conversations with um, signatories, and the first one, which was in person, took place at the IAC in Paris. We've asked signatories for their input and what is what are their interests, what is of importance to, to each individual signatory. And signatories have discussed the opportunity to help build on the Outer Space Treaty and um, specifically looking at deconfliction of activities. Um, at the IAC meeting, the concept of a safety zone was an important topic identified as requiring further discussion. And signatories also emphasized the importance of space activities that represent the diversity of people on this planet. Um, that was something that was emphasized over and over and over again, looking both at established spacefaring nations and those that are just establishing their space sector. Um, and repeated interventions were also made recognizing the need to communicate the relevance of the Artemis Accords and Artemis activities to individuals and communities in both nations that have signed the Artemis Accords and nations that have not yet done so. Communicating the importance of space remains of critical importance. And one venue where Accord signatories are also starting to share information and collaborate is the COPUS Working Group on Space Resources, which was established last year in the Legal Subcommittee. Um, over the course of its five-year work plan, the Working Group will collect information concerning the exploration, extraction, and utilization of space resources, study the existing legal framework, and develop an initial set of principles for such activities. Um, this, is an this is an important step forward and one that the United States will monitor closely. And so the Artemis Accords, I believe, will no doubt continue to guide our engagement with the international community on what responsible outer space behavior looks like as we return to the moon. Thank you. Yeah, so if I look even more tired than usual, it's because I just got back from United Arab Emirates about 48 hours ago. Uh, Kay was there as well. And lots of discussion of the accords at the Abu Dhabi space debate. This was not an event that was sponsored by or led by America in any way, yet you had this robust discussion of norms of behavior driven by the accords. And I think the accords have been a tremendous catalyst for a dialogue that we must have and must have now before problems develop and there are too many activities on the moon. And I've often had people come up to me too and say, well, what if China or Russia develops its own version of the Accords? And my response was, I couldn't think of a better success. That would be wonderful that the purpose of the Accords is to, again, push this dialogue forward because while the Outer Space Treaty is wonderful and it's the backbone and the spine of international space law, the Constitution from the United States perspective, and I believe that it's just as relevant today as it ever was back in the 60s. I always say the Outer Space Treaty, over 50 days old, 50 years old doesn't look a day over 35, but 
the reason for that is because it's a treaty of principles, of high-level principles. And those principles of avoiding harmful interference, of preventing conflict, of prohibiting weapons of mass destruction, they're all as true now as they were back in the 60s. But the problem is it's a principle. It's high level. And we need to get down to understand better what it means, how we can implement so that we can achieve the goals that were laid out by the Outer Space Treaty. And that's why, again, recovering attorney, and it was mentioned here, precedence is so important, that we're establishing precedents that then can be brought to the COPUS and then adopted by the United Nations as full-on treaties later, or at least dialogue, and at the very least, we're showing what good looks like. And I have great hopes. We'd love to see India join. China even, I believe that there's great overlap between where China is at a policy perspective and that if you were to see, I think, what people's different interpretations are of these rules, that there'd be a huge amount of commonality behind us. I think that the Accord started a conversation that will lead to bringing more countries together and discovering the common ground that can be the basis of a better future. Yeah, I think you're mentioning impact is exactly that. I, I, I cannot agree more with what you said and Kay said, and uh, because uh, at least it has renewed the international discussion about these uh, norms of uh, behaviors and for exploration. And you were talking about communication, and uh, I was about to mention effectively China and Russia, because I think this is the key. Uh, how do we discuss with the countries who will probably never sign the Artemis Accords? And uh, I think you-, you no, Let's you not say never. Let's not say never. I <laughs> Your next mission. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, because effectively, Artemis Accord provides precedent, but also experience. I think, and this is what the Artemis program is for, right? Is to go to the moon, not to settle on the moon, but to train uh, operations, uh, technologies, but also policies. And I think uh, with the, the Artemis program, we could have good uh, uh, feedbacks and experience to provide to the copios and, uh, and the materials to discuss, hopefully, with also uh, uh, countries you have just mentioned. You know, and uh, I think this is the key, and it has been discussed uh, in Paris during the ISC. Uh, now, how do we do also to, to, to discuss with Russia or China about this principle? Because at the end, if we go on the same place where we have a huge uh, you know, quantity of ice or, and we want to dig the same hole, how do we manage this situation? And I think effectively, I would love to see also a proposal from uh, China and Russia uh, about that to be able to discuss. Still room for me to speak. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so the... Uh, well, uh, the Outer Space Treaty, of course, uh, all of the principles stand true today, but the settings, the actors, the technology, of course, drastically different from them then. And um, I think, well, we, we at JAXA, we discussed quite a few times that before Artemis Accords, we didn't know what it would, such a set of rules would look like even. Now we have, like Mike said, a form of a precedent to build on. And we can uh, discuss uh, areas of future next steps where we should, we need rules uh, based on the items that is raised, the topics that are raised in the accords. Uh, and that is exactly what is happening now. Deputy Administrator um, Melroy just uh, mentioned in her uh, speech about uh, the report published by the Office of Technology uh, Policy and Strategy of NASA. Um, and that that's uh, kind of like 70 pages, though. It's, it's really um, worth reading through, I think, because it, it raises all the, uh, all the real technical questions or scientific questions that we would have to uh, keep discussing. The Accords is also just principles, in a way. And we, we all have to keep um, uh, raising real questions, like our um, pr uh, Prime Minister Kishida last year in December um, announced that uh, uh, the intention to have Japanese astronaut. Uh, in this, we don't have a differentiation between plural and singular in Japanese, which is really convenient. Um, <laughs> so I um, uh, announced this, um, that we would like to have a Japanese astronaut um, landing on the moon. Um, and uh, we, we, to, to make that happen, we have to tackle real problems. And I think that's uh, uh, to, to shed light on what the path we have to move forward on. That's what the Artemis Accord does. Great, thank you. So we'll open up the audience now for, for questions. Um, reminder, please raise your hand, state your name and affiliation.
phrase in the form of a question. Um, so, uh, uh, talk to Teresa, and then we'll work work our way back. Thank you, Teresa Hitchens with Breaking Defense. Um, I'm really interested in the engaging China issue because since they do have a pretty robust exploratory program, particularly focused on around the moon and on the moon, uh, and the U.S. has constraints about how to engage, particularly NASA has constraints about how it can engage with China on these issues. We also have a military that seems to see everything that China does near the moon as somehow a terrifying threat this minute. So how do we use the Artemis Accords? How do our allies use the Artemis Accords as a basis to try to talk to China about these issues and to cooperate? How can you use them? I'm happy to take this question first, and then I think Mike will go next. <laughs> um, so the Artemis Accords are grounded in the Outer Space Treaty. So they're meant to be inclusive and also flexible. And so we're open to having discussions about responsible behavior in space. And as Mike mentioned, we would invite any responsible spacefaring nation to sign the Artemis Accords with uh, China in particular, and I'm not the expert, but we do have the China expert there in the room if you have follow-on questions. Um, <laughs> our primary goal is to ensure space flight safety and responsible behavior in outer space, understanding that communication can be challenging. But we do discuss at every opportunity that we can, how can we work, to, how can we work together in order to ensure that our activities are conducted safely and that they do not put anyone at risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gay. <laughs> Appreciate it. State, again, this is the partnership state, always taking the bullet first. There, uh. <laughs> but I would say first, I don't want to be dismissive of national security concerns. You know, we've certainly learned in Ukraine that a strong defense is vital to protection of freedom. That being said, with China, obviously it's a nuanced issue that yes, we want to make sure that we don't fall behind relative to quantum or space-based satellite robotics, but I do believe that there's an opportunity to find common ground here. And when we develop the Accords, United Arab Emirates and many of the other you know, partners that we're developing it, and by the way, I want to push back on any narrative that it was the US that I've heard this, the US drafted the Accords and twisted arms. Every country that was involved, and again, not just eight space agencies, but eight foreign ministries, had veto power, basically, over any portion of the Accords, and which is why it's amazing how quickly we got to where we were at. And there was a definite and intentional effort to make the Accords as inclusive as possible, that, as was said, any responsible spacefaring nation could sign the Accords. And I believe that there's nothing in the Accords that China couldn't sign up to today or shouldn't sign up to today, which is why I say that I do hold out hope that there will be a time where the Chinese and many other countries that you wouldn't suspect will commit to, if not the Accords, principles like the Accords, which would still be a success. And this is where I think the private sector can play an important role, that we need to create new institutions to integrate the private sector. And that will likely come from the NGOs. And I've been a part of the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group. The name just rolls off the tongue. Uh, as well as the GEGSLA, the Global Experts Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities. Again, I do jet lag to get all of this correct. But there, uh, we had participation from the private sector, from government, and robust Chinese participation. Um, in The Hague, it was Chinese attorneys that actually contributed to a lot of what was developed with safety zones. So I believe that there's crossover. There's common ground here. And both the private sector, the government, I think we will all reach out to create as much global consensus as we possibly can. And I'm a Star Trek fan, so I'm optimistic that we can get there. Um, yes, uh, uh, well, uh, as JAXA, um, lacking the diplomatic authority or the freedom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but what, what I, I probably can say uh, is that, like we uh, have been discussing, this is 
uh, you know, something, Artemis Accords is something we can see. It has been sent to the UN. Uh, and we talk a lot about COPUS and multilateral um, discussions. Every organization, no organization is, is, is perfect. So um, we cannot expect the, the UN probably to be perfect either, though uh, they are a um, body that where, where at the high diplomatic level all the countries come to. They will uh, uh, have, I assume, they will have read the Artemis Accords, have seen it, have tried to understand it. I think this is a very important factor um, and that, that we can uh, certainly build on. Yeah, I agree. We can build, build on, on the Artemis Accords to, to discuss a good baseline and also it's a good tool for communication with the Chinese, for instance. So we have the copios. We know how it happens. There are big forums with all the people involved. And perhaps we, can, we could think about you know, implementing some dialogue as well. Um, we have in mind, for instance, uh, the Paris Peace Forum. I know that there are some dialogues between uh, uh, people who are not used to talk to each other in, in this type of forum to, 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 to tackle global challenges. And this one could be one of them, you know, uh, defining norms of behavior for outer space treaty. And uh, perhaps we could have these intermediate dialogues with China in the, this type of, um, of, uh, of frame, uh, of, uh, of uh, forum. Uh, and especially build on the, the, the Artemis Accord, effectively raise some, some points like a safety zone, Transparency as well, and all these, even these terms are, are interpreted, interpreted in a different way in different cultures in China. For instance, transparency in China, I'm not expert, but uh, means uh, not necessarily means uh, transparency, not necessarily means uh, honesty. I don't know how to say it, but you know, we need to discuss these terms, what it means, and uh, perhaps we need intermediate forum to, to, to have the, the opportunity to discuss that. Yeah, and perhaps the Paris Peace Forum could be a, a good one, uh, one of them. Uh, I'll just add, you know, Skill World's been part of some of these discussions. Uh, we're observers to UN Copious. I've not seen anything in the, the programs that China is planning, both private sector and, and government, uh, as well as their statements, that would really be at odds anything that's in the, the accords. So I think it's more of a, a political thing than a substantive thing. And of course, that's a more difficult problem to get at, right, in some, in some respects, is the, the, the politics of it. Any other questions? Um. <clears throat> Hi, Jeff Nelson, Space News. Um, you know, we've talked about that, you know, no country owns the Artemis Accords. Seen in many cases, though, a lot of the signing ceremonies have involved countries signing with the U.S., with NASA officials, France being one example like that. I'm just curious, what efforts are some of the other Artemis Accord signatories, like, like, France and Japan doing to outreach to other countries to get them to sign on to the accords? At the USA, lead by example. <laughs> <laughs> no, effectively, so, so for France, effectively, this was important for our bilateral cooperation. As I said, we are already involved through ESA to the, to the Artemis program. Uh, most of the major contributors to ESA uh, have joined the Artemis Accords in Europe, so we still miss one. I think he, he will recognize himself. But uh, so effectively, and we have this discussion, and I can tell you, for instance, and I, I was mentioning Germany. Uh, prior to, to, to sign the accord, we discussed heavily with, uh, with our friends uh, from Germany to figure out what it means also for, for Europe and, uh, and uh, for, for, for Europe in general, for the space uh, policy in Europe and for the space program in Europe as well. So we are discussing uh, internally to Europe mainly. Uh, this is what we do. And then we have the opportunity to discuss, for instance, at the ISC, this has been uh, mentioned extensively with uh, all the signatories, to discuss how we can together uh, effectively uh, uh, raise awareness of this accord to other countries who are, who are not signatories. But as far as France is concerned, I, I think mainly focus on the European countries. And uh, uh, for uh, JAXA, well, again, lacking the diplomatic authority, um, I, I would say that, like, just as um, uh, Pam said, again, uh, we would certainly, if it's brought up, we will bring it up. Um, some countries, even on, up till now, have approached asking what it's all about, what did you think? We would certainly answer with sincerity to that. Um, and that's, that's how we will try to uh, promote and explain to other countries. And Jeff, since I'm just back from Abu Dhabi, you know, yeah, yeah, see, I beat Kate of the buzzer. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll let her say it then. But, um, you know, UAE, you know, obviously with Bahrain, you know, has been a great ambassador for the Accords in the region. I think we've done really well 
uh, in the Middle East, which is very important. Uh, Israel, which now has a very close relationship, particularly in space uh, with Emirates, was also influenced. But uh, Kay, I'll turn it over to you. No, I was just going to say the same thing, that there are countries that are stepping up and organizing meetings with um, prospective signatories, as well as those that are, have already signed the Artemis Accords. And it's interesting, the conversations that they have, because in some ways, they're the same that they would with the United States organizing a meeting. But in many ways, they're also different. They're looking at how do they grow their space economy. They're looking at STEM. They're looking at education. And that makes, I think, our partnership that much stronger. And so we value um, other signatories organizing events, such as the UAE just did a week ago. So thanks. Uh, Marcia Smith, SpacePolicyOnline.com. And this is along the same lines. So, uh, Kay, you talked a lot about how the U.S. is not the gatekeeper and it's not a bilateral agreement with the U.S. So what is the mechanism, actually, for a country to come along and say they want to join? Is there a depository government or something? I mean, wh where does it exist? How do you actually tell somebody that you want to join? And do all of the existing signatories have to agree to a new country coming on? Uh, or, you know, can somebody veto it? <laughs> if they don't, like if China came along and somebody didn't like China, maybe the U.S. wanted them, but maybe somebody else didn't. I mean, how do you actually mechanically do this in, in order to let other countries come along? Sure, so those are, those are great questions. Um, and I think when the Artemis Accords first started, some of our uh, senior government representatives had those same questions. So... Mm -hmm. The Artemis Accords, the way that they are written is that there's actually an article that states if you are interested, if you are a state actor, so the Artemis Accords are only applicable to state actors, but if you would like to sign, there's a signature page template, and we only ask that that signature represent whole of government, so it can't be a space agency signing on behalf of a space agency. If you're signing, we want it to represent whole of government. And in terms of how the process works, we like to highlight signing ceremonies. Uh, so it was mentioned that the US oftentimes holds signing ceremonies. We're not re-signing the Artemis Accords. We're congratulating a new signatory. And so since we've started, and as we've done more outreach in the form of briefings and then also bilateral or multilateral consultations, countries know that I'm the point person for the State Department. We have Neil Newman right there that's the point person for NASA. And so we communicate both with either space agency representatives or Ministry of Foreign Affairs representatives to coordinate the signing process, especially if a country wishes to have a signing ceremony. And then your last question, or I guess there's two more, um, in terms of repositories. So the Artemis Accords were started remotely at the height of the pandemic. So everyone signed and then we took a picture mm -hmm. and we have PDF files. So um, state and NASA are the repositories and we do hold those signatures. Um, some of them are physical paper and some of them are PDF files. And then the last question of, well, I'm not gonna forget it. Oh, can countries uh, say no? No. Um, and, and again, we because the way that the Artemis Accords are drafted and by being grounded in the Outer Space Treaty and other international treaties, they really operationalize and provide a little bit more specificity. And so if countries have ratified the Outer Space Treaty or are par party to the Outer Space Treaty and they're committing to being responsible space actors by signing the Artemis Accords, uh, the original drafters, and, and Mike could speak to this more, agreed that it would not be then a decision-making body that would say yes or no to a prospective signatory. And perhaps if I had something, just uh, because effectively, uh, th these Artemis Accords are primarily for, as, we, as far as we understand them, for the, the countries who are willing to participate to the Artemis program first. And it's, it is written you know, for civil, for space agency willing to participate to that. And I think it gives a, a global uh, framework because it will be an, uh, a reference to the potential MOUs, the Memorandum of Understanding, the agreement we could sign uh, among agencies on a bilateral basis. But it gives us an overall framework that is shared among all the uh, signatories and all the parties, the countries that are participating to the, to the Artemis program. So this is how we see it uh, primarily. And then, as, as we said in the past, it can be used as an example to 
to, um, to help the discussion at a copious level or the forum or for, to define multilateral uh, uh, agreements or principles. Yeah. I just want to pick up quickly on something that Nicholas said. Good regulations come from good experience. When you regulate something, an activity, before it occurs, that's dangerous for the activity, for the government and the private sector. And that's exactly what the accords were meant to do, to not undermine the COPUS process, but to make it better by taking actual experience, going to international forums like the COPUS, saying this is what we experienced, this is how we dealt with it, and to then inform the decisions that a group like that will be made on actual science, on actual activities. Just remember that the accords are not the end, they're a beginning of a global discussion. Hi, Nicholas here from Alter Enterprises from London. Uh, so Mike earlier and also Pam Eller before, they talked about the importance of involvement of private players for the policy. Uh, so I would like to ask the panelists for their standpoint on how, uh, how the commercial companies, private companies can become commercial beyond the government contracts for the lunar economy. How commercial companies can participate in the policy? Yes, in the, not, not the policy itself, but how can they become commercial in the lunar economy beyond the government contracts? And what's your view on that? Yeah, so that's what success looks like when we in the private sector are having conversations about cislunar activities and we don't even mention NASA. As much as I appreciate the agency, that's where we need to be. I mean, look at what happened with commercial satellites, for example. Satellites began as a purely government activity, maybe a, a handful, a half dozen government-owned and operated satellites. And then when the private sector was able to build satellites, to create them, to deploy them, you had a growth of a sector and capabilities that we couldn't even have imagined at that time. And I believe the same will happen in cislunar space and on the moon. You know, we, we talk about the moon then and now, and, and Pam made some comments that you know, we, a decade ago, didn't even know that there was lunar ice on the moon. No, we didn't think that was bone dry. And now, you know, we know there are vast quantities of water ice. I guarantee that is not the last substantial discovery that we'll make, which could drive commercial development. So I think what the private sector needs to do, and certainly what Redwire and, and other companies have been attempting, is to find commercial markets that we can then enjoy that hopefully will grow beyond government. But government has a very important role to play in that as a customer and as a catalyst. And we've seen it in terms of cargo, crew, and now the commercial space stations, which I think is extraordinarily exciting, and will also act as an accelerant for commercializing LEO. We're moving up geographically. So we need the government to continue to pursue public-private partnerships and support those. Again, you know, we talk about it's so wonderful that we went from one administration to the another, and, and certainly uh, all the people that I pointed out did a great job getting the Armist Accords going, but without Pam Elroy, without Senator Nelson, Vice President herself has been a huge advocate for the Accords. You know, we've had this continuity, and I think even for the private sector to succeed, we need that policy continuity of going back to the moon, developing the moon, and developing it in a fashion that opens up opportunities for the private sector and the government working together. Oh, sorry. Go no, just to add that, effectively, it's, a, it's also a sensitive question because when we talk about space commerce, what do we mean? Uh, and for instance, Artemis Accord, it's clearly said that it's uh, to, to frame space activity by the space agencies or governmental uh, activities. So, you know, so for instance, when we talk about uh, um, in situ resource utilization for France, for us, it's clearly at the service of uh, institutional programs in human exploration not to dig up everywhere we want and uh, to, you know, to, to sell, to, to deep mining. And uh, I make the parallel with a statement of President Macron uh, at, uh, in November at the COP27 about uh, deep sea mining. You know, we said he made clearly the difference between expo okay for exploration, but not for exploitation, for deep sea mining. I think this is the same uh, uh, from our perspective for, for, for the moon. So this means effectively we rely on the space uh, 
uh, private uh, companies to uh, at the service of uh, effectively uh, establishing a sustainable presence on the space of the moon, exploiting the water on the surface and so on. Uh, but uh, this is purely in that frame so far, and, when, and we made clear when we talk about in situ resource utilization, this is in that frame so far for us. And this is why we signed uh, the Artemis Accord. And I'll just quickly add that um, increasingly we see space activities that are being conducted by commercial actors and also pure commercial activities. And so the Artemis Accords don't apply to those pure commercial activities, and yet the private sector seeks a predictable, predictable environment. And so it's one thing that um, my office in particular is focused on, how do we better engage the private sector to understand what is it that they that they need? Um, do they need more regulation or, or is it enough? Um, within COPUS, one, um, one example that has worked is the Federal Register Notice. So typically when you have technical presentations, it's an industry association that's selecting who is going, whereas this Federal Register Notice has opened up opportunities for smaller companies to submit and to potentially then participate. So we're, we're thinking through how is it that from a policy standpoint we can better involve the private sector so we're guided by what they need rather than telling them, um, which isn't necessarily the right thing to do. Thanks. But, um, oh, sorry. I, I'll be so sad if we didn't have that little transformer robot on iSpace. Um, so uh, to have a little bit of the, the ride is, is very welcome to us. And uh, I, I'd say just tell us how this, this you know, kind of service contrast that we're starting to have is a change of the way we work together. Um, so uh, we um, welcome the commercial sector to tell us what kind of a relationship you want to have with JAXA to, to move forward. Ah, afternoon, Jerry Case, research engineer here in DC. I'm just curious in terms of the cores, when I think of uh, trying to understand the goals, because when I think of democracy, I think of representation of ideas and people. Um, how is the cores looking into <clears throat> beyond just advancing technology capabilities cultural identities. When you think about uh, responsible behavior, I think about responsible inspiration. Are, is the core is figuring out creative ways to um, make sure the activities that we do when we explore um, space can attract the talent to produce the future? Because my concern is I would, love, I would hope that every country in, in Africa becomes signing signatories and the South American and the girl of Venezuela could see someone else on the moon playing the violin like herself or the girl in the Bronx seeing that uh, activity. So what are the activities that are, you guys are looking at culturally and artistically that can attract talent? It's a great point. And let me say when we were founding the Accords, the purpose was to create the broadest, most diverse, beyond LEO human spaceflight coalition in history. You know, diversity is really the underlying principle of the Artemis program in so many ways. Diversity of people, if you look at our astronaut corps right now for Artemis, is the most diverse, I think, in history, safe to say, Sean. Diversity in terms of countries, as we said, broadest you know, in the history of humanity. Uh, and then diversity of organizations as well. The role of the private sector is playing is also unprecedented. And we need to be able to involve all of those different types of people and types of countries to be successful globally at space exploration and to make it sustainable. And while I love the International Space Station program, again, we talk about peace prizes. I mean, I believe the ISS should be given a peace prize, that it is, we take it for granted, I think, too much, particularly in the space world, that there's this internationally constructed, incredibly complex piece of machinery orbiting the Earth every day with a multinational group of diverse astronauts supporting it. It's amazing, and we need to keep that going via the Artemis program. But one of the challenges with the ISS is it's very difficult for new countries to join the intergovernmental agreement, the IGA for the ISS, even though we've had hundreds, obviously, of countries participate. And the idea with the Accords was no matter whether it's a, a wealthier country and one with a lot of space resources or capabilities, such as Japan and France, or a country like a Bahrain, 
or African countries or Colombia. I mean, that's why, well, again, absolutely thrilled to have, obviously, France and Japan involved. Uh, I, get, do, I do get particularly excited, though, over some of these smaller countries and their involvement because we have to have them. And in terms of what they would do, even if it's as modest as some grad students studying some of the lunar imagery or science to help us out, even that, I think, can make a huge difference and add to the diversity and vibrancy, sustainability, and ultimately success of the Accords. And, and if I may, this is one of the key action we took, the near-term action, it was mentioned by Pam uh, during the last uh, meeting in IAC, how to identify um, opportunities for emerging space yes. nations to, to come up. And, and was focus man nations, you know, the emerging countries like that. And you're mentioning Africa and uh, tomorrow there is the uh, US African summit organized by SPI and, uh, and uh, space, I think Chirag Parik will be a part of it or probably other colleagues there and uh, space will be a uh, part of the discussion as well. So, and I know that in Africa, in Latin America, they, are, they have an initiative to, to gather to, to enter the space business and exploration. Uh, just to pick up on that, I think you know, countries like, like Mexico joining and Brazil, I think that was, they're not traditional human spaceflight countries and they're not traditional human spaceflight partners in the United States. I think that, that signals a change. And, and to your point, and, and our discussions on these countries, they are looking at this differently. They're, they're looking for different things, not just to, to, to go to the moon or something, but also benefits on earth. I think it's why a lot of the countries are looking at at participating in the program because they're still looking for how does this help our population, how does it help our citizens, how does it help our economy. Um, so I'm seeing that from some of the discussions of the, the the newer countries that are joining the Accords and are thinking about joining. I said there's going to be a couple of announcements uh, very soon. It should be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, so with that, uh, we are at time for today. Um, two quick things before we close up. One, we're going to be posting the recording of the event hopefully early next week. Uh, so if you've missed anything, it'll be up on our YouTube channel. Um, the second thing, if you haven't yet, please eat some cake on the way out. Uh, hopefully someone's cut into that by now, uh, but I don't, I don't want to take that home. So, so and Mike doesn't want to take it on the airplane tonight. Um, so, so please eat some cake. And so with that, please join me in thanking our panelists.